Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this IIEA online event on LGBTI uh, equality in the EU, which coincides with the launch of the European Commission's uh, strategy on LGBTI equality in the Union for the period 2021 to 25. My name is Peter Gunning. I'm moderating uh, this event, which uh, falls within the scope of the IIEA's current uh, Global Europe project. Um, we're delighted to have two distinguished uh, speakers with us today on our panel, um, Minister Thomas Byrne and Michael O'Flaherty, whom I will introduce uh, shortly. Um, you'll be able to join this discussion in a variety of ways, uh, through Zoom, of course, and uh, you may submit uh, questions, which we will come to at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the session through the Zoom Q&A um, function. Um, you can also uh, follow the event on Twitter, uh, at IIEA. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, the discussion or the chat function there can also be used uh, to submit questions. The entire event is uh, live streamed and is on the record. Um, so Minister Byrne will speak to us first. Thomas Byrne is the Irish Minister of State for European Affairs with responsibilities both at the Department of the Taoiseach and the Department of Foreign Affairs and uh, has been in that role since July of this year. He is uh, a, a member of our Irish Parliament for Mead East and um, he has also been a member of um, the Irish Senate and is a qualified solicitor. Um, Minister Byrne has a great deal of experience compressed into the, the period between July and December from the preparation that he will be will have been involved in for meetings of the European Council, uh, most recent one last Thursday and Friday, and his representation of uh, Irish views in the General Affairs Council, as well as through, I'm sure, the Minister's interactions with his uh, counterparts in the governments of the, the 27. Michael O'Flaherty is a distinguished name in fundamental rights, both in Ireland and in Europe and indeed internationally. He is with us today in his capacity as the director of the European Union's Fundamental Rights Agency, which is based in Vienna and which uh, happily uh, has this year celebrated its 10th anniversary, I think. Michael uh, has a distinguished uh, career both on the academic side in Nottingham and in his native uh, Galway at the National University of Ireland. He has worked in a, a UN context, both in headquarters and in the field. And uh, he has chaired uh, the Northern Ireland Chief Commissioner, he was of the Northern Ireland Human Rights uh, Commission. Um, he is a solicitor of the Irish courts, and he has a doctor of laws from the National University of Ireland. The Fundamental Rights Agency is a most valued uh, uh, organ of the European Union, uh, providing uh, it is a, a center of both reference and excellence for the promotion and uh, uh, protection of fundamental rights throughout the Union. And I'm sure that it's uh, contribution to the work which has gone into the Commission's uh, recent um, publication of its strategy is very, very substantial. Without further ado, I'll invite um, Minister Byrne to address you first for uh, about 15 minutes, uh, and that will be followed by an address from um, the Director of the FRA, Michael O'Flaherty. Minister Byrne, the floor is yours. Should we say the screen? <laughs> we're uh, we're in unprecedented times, and it's uh, it's uh, we're doing these all the time. And I suppose we're it's we're losing the ability to meet each other personally. But actually, in my experience, we're we're, we're getting greater numbers of attending many webinars. And I think that's that's one advantage. If there is an advantage in these dreadful pandemic times, just to thank you, uh, Peter, for chairing it, and it's an honour to be to speak and for your kind words, uh, and to thank the IIEA for the excellent work that you continue to do. Uh, and they've done throughout this year. I mean, it's extraordinary the, the list of events that you have uh, with high profile speakers. I know that you had hoped to have my, my French counterpart, Clement Bone, uh, last Monday, I believe, at, at the Institute. Uh, he told me he's very keen to come to Ireland as, as, as soon as possible again. So 
uh, perhaps when, when, hopefully when a deal is done. Uh, so I have no doubt that uh, you, you would be extending an invitation again to him if, if you can. Um, and delighted to join Michael as well. And I'm, I'm constantly promoting, promoting careers uh, in Europe and in the European Union and associated institutions and, and, and Europe-wide bodies. And uh, I'm glad to see Michael the leading, leading light in that regard, promoting human rights in Ireland, the EU, and indeed the, the world itself, because we are the beacon, we should be the beacon uh, for human rights uh, around the world. When we see the rule of law under threat in, in, in democracies, when we see human rights under threat in democracies, somebody has to shine, hold that torch. We all need to do that, but Michael clearly has a, a very important leadership function there. Um, and again, it's it's just a, another example, and I've been, I'm giving these every day to both to school children and to college graduates and to young professionals in terms of what Irish people can achieve and, and what we can actually do uh, at the European level. And it's not just about a career, but actually about, as I said, shining that light and, and promoting uh, what are the fundamental values of the European Union treaties, which are really corresponding with the fundamental values uh, in principle of our own constitution as interpreted by the, uh, the courts and developed uh, throughout, throughout the decades. Today's discussion is one that affects each and every one of us. Uh, we are all affected uh, when we live in an unjust society. We all have a role to play in promoting and protecting LGBTI plus rights. Uh, my remarks uh, focus on uh, those rights in an international European uh, context, in particular in relation to the publication of the Commission's new uh, LGBTIQ equality strategy. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's never been more important uh, that we do that that we heighten the profile of that issue, such as in these webinars. Uh, and indeed, I'm encouraging my, my, my doll and Shannon colleagues to heighten the profile of this issue uh, in the National Parliament as well. I think we think there's a lot of work to be done, as I said, to shine that, that light. Um, but I'd like to reflect briefly on the situation in Ireland. I think Irish society has changed a lot. Uh, over the past 30 years, we have seen major progress. We've seen changes of laws, but they, um, as I say, in Irish, a um, change of mentality, I suppose. Um, and it's worth remembering, it's only in 1993 that uh, Morgan Quinn, following on from the case brought by David Norris, uh, decriminalising Dal Aaron, uh, same-sex sex sexual activity. That can be hard to believe, but it is, it is still illegal in many countries in the world as well. Um, so positive progress has continued to be made, of course, since then, with a range of legislation that has gradually made it easier for LGBTI plus people to live a full and free life in Ireland. But there's work to be done, uh, of course, and certainly work to be done around Europe. I'm sure many of us can recall uh, the celebrations in May 2015 when Ireland became the first country in the world uh, to have a popular, and it was a popular, vote uh, for marriage equality. Uh, the vote and the celebrations that followed were an important demonstration of the progress that we have made as a society, but also a signal as well uh, to the wider world, and I think a really important signal uh, because that certainly achieved, uh, as I said, it was an international first, but it certainly achieved international prominence and paved the way then uh, for some other societies uh, to respond positively as well. Unfortunately, it didn't pave the way for different societies. There are certain other societies that have maybe gone uh, in reverse uh, on these issues. Um, there has been progress, but as I said already, I'm conscious that there's still much more to do. Um, and now the responsibility is not uh, placed on, on the enormous on the shoulders, the enormous shoulders of, of courageous individuals. Um, and I certainly see that when I see David Norris, and I, I'm glad to have a good conversation with him last week in, in the Dal Canteen. Uh, you know the work that he did over the years, and many others beside as well. And the suffering as well that uh, some people, um, and indeed many uh, LGBTI uh, people, uh, had to suffer over the years uh, because of societal attitudes. But the government of Ireland and the governments of many other countries were actively promoting and protecting. Uh, LGBTI plus rights all around the world. Obviously, Ireland's been on a journey uh, ourselves, and we want other people to, 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 to buy that ticket, to join that journey. Um, and protecting and promoting the rights of LGBTI plus people in a, is a key priority under uh, our strategy, the global island, Ireland's foreign policy for a changing world. So our, our efforts, though, as we see them on the international stage, are strengthened when we act together with fellow EU member states, vast majority are of like mind, and indeed the institutions of the EU. Irish missions then cooperate closely on the ground with EU delegations and embassies of other EU member states to advocate for the rights of LGBTI plus persons, including advocating for the decriminalisation of homosexuality where it exists, and against its criminalisation where this is uh, uh, contemplated. And 
our, our ambassadors and diplomatic officials around the world, I have to say, if someone were to write down exactly what they're doing in this area, uh, it really is extraordinarily heroic work and I'm very grateful for them. But the EU has an important role to play, obviously, as a region that upholds, that protects the rights of individuals. But as a union, we have to continue to make sure our own house is in order. We have to live up to the standards set in our treaties and of our own rhetoric. That's not to say that we can only raise questions of others once we're perfect, but encouraging progress externally must go hand in hand with securing and encouraging progress internally. So the recognition of the need for internal progress is very important. So I was really pleased to see that the European Commission was publishing uh, this new strategy, uh, which Ursula von der Leyen had committed to uh, on her taking up the position as president of the European Commission. So Ireland welcomes then the launch by the European Commission of the EU's LGBTI use policy strategy 2020 to 2025. It's particularly important in the face in, of, in some countries, increasing discriminations, um, not just in the EU, but, but worldwide on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. So Ireland very strongly supports the European Commission and its work in this area. As the guardians of the treaties, this is the Commission's job to ensure that member states live up to the value of the European Union as enshrined in our treaties. It's an extremely important step that the Commission has launched this document that addresses the inequalities and challenges facing LGBTIQ people in order to move to a union of equality. The strategy outlines some worrying statistics of increasing discrimination uh, on grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity, and uh, sex uh, expression and, and, and sex characteristics within, within the European Union. I mean, it's right. Ireland welcomes the targeted actions across four pillars, tackling discrimination against LGBTQ people, ensuring their safety, building inclusive societies, uh, and leading the call for equality around the world. The European Union and equality in Europe as well. Uh, the European Union must have a strong voice in multilateral fora and we must lead the call for equality around the world. LGBTI uh, plus uh, persons continue to face discrimination and violence in many countries. Discriminatory laws criminalize same-sex relations in some countries, exposing people to criminal sanctions, sanctions on the basis of their identity uh, and, and in several countries, the death penalty. To this end, Ireland will continue to raise its voice and do everything within our power in support of LGBTI plus rights internationally. Ireland strongly supports efforts in international human rights forums, including the Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly Third Committee, which address LGBTI plus rights. In 2019, we joined the Equal Rights Coalition, an intergovernmental coalition of 42 countries dedicated to advancing the human rights of LGBTI plus people and promoting inclusive development. We also welcome the commitment in the strategy that the Commission would support member states to develop national plans on LGBTIQ equality. This is an area where Ireland has placed high priority on in recent years and made significant efforts. In 2019, the Department of Justice launched our own inclusion strategy. The overall aim of this strategy is to target discrimination, promote inclusion and improve uh, quality of life and well-being for LGBTI plus people. In 2018, the Department of Children produced a national LGBTI plus youth strategy, which is the first of its kind in the world. This strategy seeks to ensure a cross-governmental approach to enhance the lives of young LGBTI plus uh, people and address some of the key challenges they may face in their day-to-day -day lives. These strategies provide an important written statement of our intentions in this, in this area, but the challenges can't be underestimated. I'm confident that working in consultation and collaboration with representative groups and indeed the LGBTI plus community, we will be able to make even further progress. At home and abroad, there is still much work to be done and lots of challenging conversations to come and I've no doubt that uh, the questions will be challenging. But I can assure you today that we're committed to promoting and protecting uh, human rights and living up to our responsibilities at home within the EU internationally. I look forward to hearing more from Michael in the broader EU context and look forward to hearing questions from everyone joining us online. Um, and without reservation, uh, I would say, and maybe the questions can follow on from this, uh, the issue of um, the particular discrimination that's going on now in Poland, I think is touching or striking a chord with a lot of people uh, around Europe. It attracts huge media attention. And I think, I think that is one way uh, to try and, 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 and get progress there, get change uh, in Poland. It's very worrying, it's very sad. Um, and it's not really what Europe should be about. Very much.
Minister, thank you very much indeed uh, for a very wide-ranging introduction to the to the theme, and uh, you've br brought up points which I imagine we will be returning to uh, during the last mentioned one there, uh, in the context perhaps of even last week's uh, European Council. I'm now happy to to give the word to um, the director of the Fundamental Rights Agency, Michael O'Flaherty. Michael, you're welcome to take the floor. Peter, thank you very much indeed, and. Uh... Thanks to you, to you, Minister Byrne, and to the IIEA for today's event. I'm very happy to be with you. I would wish it were physical, but there'll be another opportunity, I guess, uh, once we get out of this crazy year. Um, dear friends, 13 years ago, almost to the day, I was in Jogjakarta in Indonesia. I was uh, spending a few days there among a group of human rights specialists to map out the application of existing human rights law with regard to the lived experience of people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. We developed what became known as the Jogjakarta Principles, which played a role in shining a light uh, on the extent to which LGBTI people were not being paid attention to within the, uh, the, the general mainstream promotion and protection of human rights, and how as a result, they were being shoved to the very age edges. We had some success with those principles, but even with that success, uh, I could not have believed 13 years ago where I'd be eight years ago. Uh, when I was uh, at the event, the minister mentioned I was in the Upper Castle Yard uh, for the uh, count of the vote in the referendum on marriage equality. Uh, hard to believe that so much could have been achieved in so, shoo, so few years. But for all the euphoria of the Upper Castle Yard in 2015, of course, nobody claims that uh, things were suddenly made perfect with equal enjoyment of human rights for everybody. And we've been increasingly worried in an EU setting uh, over recent years of uh, a decline, uh, going backward as much as a failure to progress across so many aspects of human experience. It's on that basis that we did a major survey, uh, the results of which we published just last May, on the experience of what it's like to be LGBTI and living here in the European Union. We surveyed 140,000 people, largest survey of its kind ever attempted anywhere in the world. We covered all 27 member states. And since the uh, data was gathered in 2019, uh, we also included the United Kingdom, as well as uh, two observer states uh, to the agency, Serbia and North Macedonia. Uh, frankly, the results were deeply discouraging. They confirmed the anecdotal indications that things are bad and in some places getting worse. And uh, when I present you with just a few figures now, I'll also compare those figures to those of a survey my agency conducted back in 2012 to give a sense of the changes over time. Firstly, when we asked people if they had experienced forms of harassment or violence during the past uh, five years, 58% said yes, they had. Back in 2012, the figure was 45 we asked them, had they experienced an act of discrimination in the past year? By the way, these are the EU averages, of course. Uh, we asked, had they experienced an act of discrimination? 43%, almost half, said yes. Earlier in 2012, that had been just 37%. Uh, things get exponentially worse, by the way, uh, when we uh, break down within the LGBTI groups, the different experiences uh, of the different groups, such as uh, T, trans, and I, intersex. So uh, when trans people were asked if they experienced discrimination, uh, it was 60% uh, had said, yes, they had within the past year. Now, if somebody is attacked or is subject to um, or, uh, some form of active discrimination, how often do they report the matter to the authorities? And this, by the way, is a critical question because it's the basis on which we can measure the levels of the problem in our societies. Uh, and therefore, the answer is, is very worrying. Just 14% of people said they reported a physical attack and just 17% an act of discrimination. Then we turn to, logically enough, following that, uh, because the reason people don't complain is because they're afraid of the outcomes. We asked about the levels of confidence in the state, uh, how trusting uh, are the LGBTI communities uh, in the willingness of the state to protect them? Or to put it the other way, to what extent do they lack the confidence? The EU-wide average was 66% lack confidence. But here I would have to say is one of the 
questions asked where there's the widest disparity from country to country. So to take two examples, in Malta, 83% of people said they trust the state to take care of them. And then when you go to Poland and ask the question, uh, the figure uh, plummets to 4%. Just 4% said they trusted the state in Poland. Now, before I get to some Ireland specific um, uh, uh, content, uh, let me just report some uh, encouraging news. It's, uh, it's not a good news story, uh, but there were some encouraging indicators. Uh, the first was that in general, we saw since 2012, a notable drop in, in, in the perception by the LGBTI community members that society is prejudiced. So that, you know, to put it another way around, that society is growing more tolerant is a, is a, is a wide and growing view. Uh, we also saw age disparities. Uh, the younger people are, the more hopeful they are uh, of their society. Uh, and we saw changes in the school experience, a greater openness and willingness of schools to engage with the diversity of their pupils. But now let me come to Ireland. Uh, and uh, Ireland is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, like Malta, frankly, very similar figures, uh, is puzzling. Uh, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a great... Uh, there's a great contradiction in the Irish and the Maltese figures. Uh, when we ask uh, the LGBTI people from Ireland, uh, did they experience a drop in levels of prejudice in society? Unsurprisingly, 77% said yes, they had seen a drop or a rise in respect. And when we asked about levels of trust in the government, the figure was a very healthy 67% said they do trust the government to take care of their interests. But after that, when we looked at other elements of the lived experience, the Irish figures look more or less the same as the EU averages. So uh, how many, what percentage harassed in the past year? In Ireland, 37%, EU average, 38%. How many has been subject to a physical attack in the past five years? In Ireland, 11%, the EU, 11%. How many had experienced an act of discrimination in the past year? 38% which is actually 10 points higher than the EU average of 28. And then one I find always very telling, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real indicator of levels of trust and, and comfort in your society. How many same-sex couples are willing to walk down the street holding hands? Well, uh, in Ireland, the figure is just 41%. 59% uh, of the LGBTI people questioned said they would not hold hands with a same-sex partner walking down the street which is more or less the same as the EU average, which is 61%. So maybe we can come back in the discussion to this, how we can have the amazing legislative changes uh, uh, that we've already referred to. We can have the sense within a community of greater acceptance and trust, and at the same time, uh, comparable to the EU-wide figures for discrimination, harassment, under-reporting, and so forth. So, but, but let me move on to the second and final part of my opening words, uh, about, about the necessary uh, responses in law, policy, and practice. And this is where I really welcome the uh, IIEA initiative uh, uh, to mark the adoption of the EU strategy. It is a game changer. 12 November, just a couple of weeks ago, an equality strategy for LGBTIQ people from 2020 to 2025. Um, there are very important recommendations in here that can and I believe will make a difference. I'm particularly pleased that many of them build on recommendations we at the Fundamental Rights Agency made a few months earlier in the context of our new survey results. So among the action points uh, of the strategy are first, a commitment by the com EU Commission to extend the list of EU hate crimes, uh, uh, to, to make clear EU-wide uh, the, the, the um, LGBTIQ dimension uh, of, hate cr of, of hate crime. Second, there's a renewed commitment by the Commission to deliver on the long-awaited Equal Treatment Directive. Now, whether it can be delivered or not is an entirely different matter, but the political will is clearly there. Third, the, the Commission, in this context, but also others, has committed to do a health check of the Employment Equality Directive to make it more, as we say, fit for purpose. There's a commitment in the strategy uh, by the Commission to strengthen equality bodies at national levels, including with resources and funds. Uh, very interestingly, the Commission uh, has indicated that it will start a pathway towards mutual recognition 
of the diversity of the forms of family, including to protect free movement in the context of what are sometimes called rainbow families. And there's a strong commitment to support member states and civil society for all manner of initiatives to strengthen the place of the LGBTI communities. So these are great. These are really important. Uh, we're right at the beginning, but I have no doubt, not least given the leadership of Commissioner Helena Daly, who was transformative of the legal regime in Malta when she was minister there, uh, I've no doubt that the strategy will get serious attention. But let's keep in mind, of course, that it's limited by definition. It's an EU strategy. It's limited to the EU competency space. And much of our lived experience is beyond the EU competency. And so for the delivery of the strategy itself, but more broadly to deliver for true equality and true respect for everyone, uh, the commitment on the part of member states uh, is absolutely critical. And here, let me come back to a number of uh, uh, recommendations that my own agency has issued in recent months, which I think you, I could suggest can be read in a complementary way to those put forward by the Commission. In the first place, uh, we're calling for a national action plans for respect for the rights of LGBTI persons. And I listened carefully to Minister Byrne just now speaking about the Irish strategies, which obviously I welcome. Uh, but more generally, we don't have action plans uh, everywhere. Uh, uh, in the EU, and we need smart planning that's time bound, has clear goals, that's matched by the necessary data collection so that progress can be measured. We also need in our action plans, in our strategies, in every effort of our states, we need to identify the distinct experience of the different communities within the LGBTI, uh, LGBTIQ world. Uh, the experience is very different. Uh, as I said earlier, if you are trans or intersex, your life experience is going to be much more challenging than if you're LGB uh, as a general rule. And we have, to, we have to focus attention on particular and diverse needs. We also need to um, pay attention to how we all live our lives. We don't live in, in a box. Uh, I'm in a, uh, in, a, in a heterosexual box or I'm in a gay box or I'm at this or I'm at that. We live much more complex realities than that. Uh, we live so-called intersectional lives. Uh, and we have to take account of this dimension of how we live our ordinary day-to-day -day life in our policy responses. That means that if you're a gay migrant, uh, you're going to have particular needs that are different to those of a non-migrant uh, or, or to a, um, a, a non-gay migrant. Uh, and I could give many other examples, but I choose that one because that's actually one that the commission focuses on. Uh, in the new strategy. Um, and uh, just one or two last points. Um, again, regardless of the strategic approach we take, the nature of our action planning, uh, of our joined up responses, uh, we need an all of society commitment uh, to investing in the celebration of our diversity. Uh, this is something I think Ireland does well. Uh, uh, Irish people do well and generously, I think, uh, but we must never lose sight of its importance uh, of everybody investing in, 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 in celebrating the, the differentness in our community as one of its deepest and greatest uh, uh, richnesses. Uh, the, um, my very last point uh, is that, uh, and I would make this point if I was speaking today about the rights of Roma, the rights of migrants, uh, the rights of older people, it doesn't matter which group, but it's no less important here that we not work for the human rights and the fundamental rights of the LGBTIQ communities, not for, but with. It's, it's vital to success that there's a respectful co-traveling, uh, hand in hand, if I may borrow that phrase from earlier, uh, to, um, to deliver uh, on our uh, objectives. And so, um, Peter, if I could just wrap up with one memory from Jog Jakarta 13 years ago. Uh, after we published the Jog Jakarta Principles, um, somebody posted on social media, I forget who and from where, to be honest, but he, he posted a message on social media. He said, yesterday I was nothing, but today I'm a human being. What he meant was he had, he had seen in these principles that human rights also applied to him, that he was a rights holder who could demand and claim his basic entitlements in society. And I think our goal has to be to help work with everybody everywhere who needs that help so that everybody can make that great claim that maybe yesterday I was nothing, but today I'm a human being uh, living with full honoring of my dignity within my society. Thank you.
Thank you for a very inspiring um, introduction, Michael. And I noticed, of course, that you're drawing on a tremendous uh, range of information and, and data available to you and through the work of the, the agency in, in putting together that picture of uh, the, the across uh, the European Union and slightly beyond it, uh, you mentioned Serbia and North Macedonia. Uh, there is a problem, I, it seems to me, in, in using the EU average approach in, in, in that uh, the range across the continent is, is very, very uh, marked and wide. Is it, do you think that it's fair, is it accurate uh, to think of this uh, progress in relation to LGBTI uh, plus rights as exhibiting um, a West-East divide across the Union? Is that a, in, in general, um, is that something that you think is uh, a, a fair depiction of our, of our Union? And indeed for, for the minister as well, whether in his interactions with his colleagues, that is something that he perceives. I, either of you first, I don't mind. Well, I, I think I should defer to the minister. Uh, Excuse me, that's uh, one of the problems of online engagement now. We, 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 we are. <laughs> On inappropriate occasions, but luckily enough, I was muted there, <laughs> rather than the other way around. Um, no, I think East-West is probably a bit simplistic. I think, look, and even even generalising about countries as well, I think can be simplistic too. I think you have policies of certain governments uh, of certain countries, or the facilitation of policies in, within certain countries, um, even at a local level, uh, is actually in some cases in Poland, in particular, causing huge angst among many Polish people. Uh, I would say. Um, so I wouldn't like to simplistically do it uh, on, on, on that geographical basis. Um, I think we have many allies in Eastern Europe, um, but we do have to, I think some of the issues have, have really, really risen to the surface very, very quickly in the last year and a half, some really, really observable issues that we really need to tackle very, very quickly. Um, and I think, I think the only way we can do that really is through engagement with Poland and, and similar countries, but encouraging them and encouraging their own citizens as well and, and putting pressure and being constructive. We are all friends in this European Union, but I mean, I know it's a Colby has written to his Polish colleague. I've written to my Polish colleague. The ambassador is doing tremendous work in, in Poland as well in terms of opening the program. I, I think that, that we need to really up all of us up our game on this very, very quickly because I think things could begin to get out of hand. But no, I wouldn't generalise it even within countries, I have to say. Uh, or in East West divide, I think that would be the, the wrong approach. I think, uh, Peter, I'd agree. I agree. I actually entirely agree with the minister there. Um, and, and in fact, our, our figures dispute this idea of an East West divide in some kind of crude fashion. Uh, I, I, already, I already gave you the Irish stats, which show that we're not out of the, not out of the woods. We have problems ourselves. Uh, but uh, it, it, let me give you a shocking uh, 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 data set from this recent survey of ours. The worst evidence of victimization and violence uh, isn't coming from, uh, uh, let's say, the Eastern European region. It's coming from the following countries, France, Netherlands, Belgium and Sweden. Uh, so that defies any simplistic analysis. Um, and again, as the minister said, and I couldn't agree more, uh, some of the most passionate defenders, some of the bravest civil society standing up for these issues are to be found in exactly the countries that I think are maybe in some people's minds here. But. Um, I, I, I actually, as a general rule, I mean, when I'm in an Irish event, I'll use Irish figures, but as a general rule, I avoid picking on a country because it's a distraction. It creates a sense that it's somebody else's problem rather than our own. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's really important on this and any number of other surveys we do and research we do around the union uh, to, to, to recall the problems are everywhere. Indeed. Can I just add though, and I, I, I would agree there, but I have to say, I think these yellow signs popping up in Poland in particular on the edges of towns, LGBT free zones, I, I think they're a particular problem. And I know that there's lots of other things that your research is showing that, that we're not paying attention to. But I think if that's allowed to continue to develop as it has for the last year and a half or so, I think it's only about then, uh, I think we're in for some serious problems. And I just, I think generally right-minded people, which is almost everybody will, will find, I, I personally find it disgusting. I mean, it was really, uh, it was a really good, um, one of the newspapers had a two or four page spread about it 
And it really hit home to me, I have to say. And I think anyone reading that would just be absolutely horrified. I think that is one thing that is just so visible. And I think if we allow that to continue, or it's not entirely within our control, but if, if, if that's allowed to continue, uh, I think I think we're in for a lot of trouble. And other people with similar mentalities uh, will, 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 will get ideas and that, that may start to spread. So that, that, that those yellow signs to me are the embodiment of uh, just a horrible situation that just has to be put to an end very, very quickly. Look, uh, Peter, can I just jump in? I look here again. I just want to agree with the minister. There's no disagreement between us whatsoever. Uh, it's repugnant. Uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen described LGBTI free zones as humanity free zones. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a good way of putting it. And uh, I'm not here to defend actions from the Commission in Brussels, but I'd have to observe that they are taking action. They are cutting off local authority grants and things of that nature. So um, within the limited toolbox available, uh, it's not being ignored. And it's, it's, it's abhorrent. There's no question about that. It's also, by the way, it's also idiotic. Uh, it's, it's, it's based on perverse ideology that's not about humans and it's not about human thriving or about communities. Can I come back to the minister and, and say that, I mean, to the, Poland is no longer a, a new member of the, the European Union. Of course, it's the, it goes back to an Irish presidency in 2004. But there is a problem in the union, uh, I think, and it's more general than in relation to LGBTQ, of a, a certain amount of um, adherence to the principles of policies, including in the relation of fundamental rights, only to find that there is backsliding <laughs> once the threshold has been crossed and membership has been attained. So Minister, I know that enlargement is not a particularly active topic at the moment. Nonetheless, in the Western Balkans, it's still on the agenda of the union. Um, do you, do you, is, is, that a, is there a, are there tools, is there leverage that can be used in the, um, in the enlargement area with countries uh, such as Serbia, which has been mentioned, North Macedonia and others, Albania, who are in the queue to join? Yeah, and North Macedonia and Albania should be much further on along the, the, the line than they are. They've, North Macedonia in particular has been held up by other issues concerning its, its language, um, which is an obscure issue, but it's, it's, a, it's important to Bulgaria. But I'd be very keen that we, we do continue the accession process. So I think that that is one way to, to at least make improvements. Uh, and as you said, it is certainly a concern that you get to the stage and you, you tick all the boxes, uh, but how do we ensure that that, that continues? Well, I think I think, yes, we can have legal rules, yes, we can have conditionality, yes, we can have um, rule of law procedures, um, um, all, all that we're doing at the moment. But I think, ultimately, the only thing that will work is to really show, show them the light. I think, for example, in the case of Poland, this will be the case for, for, for new member states as well. They're highly dependent on, on the business environment, uh, on the European single market. Businesses generally don't like this type of thing. You know, they generally are the same as any of the rest of us. They have staff members who are gay. They have staff members who are trans. They have, um, you know, they, they want to be in an environment that, that works for them as well. And I have to think particularly in the case of Poland, I think that's one area of a non-legal recourse or one area of non-official pressure that could be made to work. And I would certainly invite the business community to get more active in that as well because mm -hmm. uh, it's another tool. But well, I think it's a, it's a tool that, that Poland has as a, you know, progressively business-focused country, um, you know, imports and exports, does business. Uh, I think it's something we're going to have to, to, to exert more, use business to express their concerns about this. And many of them are already expressing concerns, for example, about the Polish judicial system, another rule of law issue. Um, but, but I think that's one way to go because clearly rules and regulations and expressions of fundamental values, they don't work for everybody. I wish they did. But they, so we need to use other, other methods like that. Yeah. Michael, I, I know the, the FRA doesn't extend to the, to the neighbourhood, but perhaps uh, all the same, you've been uh, able to invite, uh, as you mentioned, Serbia and some others to participate in some of the surveys. Yeah, uh, if, um, if, a, if a state is an applicant to the EU and it meets certain conditions, it can be uh, admitted as an observer to the agency, mm -hmm. which for our purpose 
means that we treat them co-equally with everybody else. And it's it's very useful because it's an increasing number of people of countries now in the Western Balkans, uh, and uh, it's um, it's 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 uh, it's uh, I think it's of an undoubted benefit to kind of throw a, a comparative light on the situation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the internal EU member states, and also to pick up good practice. It's not about um, it's it's not about focusing exclusively on problems. It's it's broadening the pool of good practice from which to borrow for everybody else. Um, I, I I used to work in the Western Balkans uh, back during the uh, war in former Yugoslavia. I was stationed in Bosnia and uh, also for some time in Croatia. And uh, even then, you know, there are things that just work there that don't work somewhere else. And that's that's also part of this this engagement. Um, but if I could come more broadly to the issue of um, of, of 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 the um, capacity to res to ensure respect for the rules. Um, the toolbox is, of course, relatively limited, but there have been important developments in the last few months in the EU. Uh, we have the, uh, the, 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 the rule of law tool put in place with uh, the annual reporting by the Commission, and that's still only at the beginning. Uh, we haven't had the national debates that are intended to be triggered by these annual rule of law um, reports. And we have uh, real progress, I think. I'm a bit of an optimist, I know, but I see real progress in the funding conditionality uh, 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 d debate in terms of the next budget. Uh, there will be some form of scrutiny for fundamental rights compliance in the spending of EU monies. And I believe that that will make a real difference. Um, and then the only other thing I'd say in terms of protect, of, of, of ensuring respect for rights across the EU, the whole right across every bit of it, uh, is the urgency now of investing in civil society, in protecting the NGOs, in protecting the other civil society voices. They're coming under pressure everywhere and they, they do far more. They play far bigger a role than I think is, 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 is currently acknowledged. And so, so side by side with the legal developments, we need to invest in the, the soft supports uh, to the brave uh, NGO human rights defenders. Mm -hmm. Just following up on the, the soft support idea, I mean, if you look at the, the Commission's uh, strategy document, it's a very interesting read, by the way, including on the, the, uh, the point the Minister has made in relation to the business environment and the very positive contribution of uh, diversity and inclusion policies to, to economic, uh, to, to economic well-being. But it, of course, the, the strategy does include a number of hard um, proposals uh, you mentioned, I think, going back to the, uh, the Equal Treatment Directive, and you mentioned extension of the uh, definition of hate crimes, uh, there are, and there are others as well. Both of these, as far as I know, involve unanimity in the Council. So, I mean, what realistically are the prospects for getting measures like this uh, through, or do you think indeed that there's a case for um, adjusting the unanimity rule uh, in, in it, which it's, it's available to do so through the passerelle thing. But uh, is that, uh, are these, are these um, viable um, measures that the commission was uh, proposing to put forward? Minister? Oh, the minister. Or, my, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm delighted to hold back. <laughs> That's a difficult question. The passerelle clause is uh, something that uh, we don't hugely talk about because obviously the issue of vetoes and uh, um, states guard their, their vetoes generally, but certainly the Irish public does. So it's, it would be possibly controversial uh, here. Um, look, we've just got through an MFF document, which you know actually has you know it's not perfect, but broadly welcomed uh, mm -hmm. as a step forward, and that was done through unanimity. Um, and you know certainly if there were two member states there who weren't. Um, fighting their good fight, as they, as they see it, I don't agree with them in any way. Um, they, they certainly, it would have been a different document had they not been involved, had they not had the views that they had. But uh, hmm, I'd be reluctant to, I, I'd be reluctant to move away from, if unanimity is required, I'm not clear it's required and everything, but if it's required, I'd be looking to move away from it. And I just point to the fact the MFF can be done uh, on that basis, um, is what I'd say on that, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point that, uh, I mean, last weekend might be disappointing to some, but uh, as looked at the other way, it's, it's the approval of two massive uh, um, spending programs from the EU, one unprecedented in its nature and its scope. And, and with that conditionality, as I say, and, an and one, but it's there, you know, and it's Indeed. Strong. Indeed. Michael? 
Uh, I, don't, I don't have much to add. Um, let me just, I suppose, uh, say that as well that having high level discussion around these issues will bring its own benefit, regardless of what the negotiation outcome will be. You know, getting this repeatedly put into council configurations for discussion, appearing in council conclusions, that's all part of the in incremental growth in willingness and acceptance uh, of the expansion, for example, of hate crimes uh, or for the, uh, uh, the equal treatment legislation. So there's, a, there's, there's, no, there's no convincing reason not to pursue these. Okay. Can I just add as well, just in relation to, I don't know whether Michael or, or Peter mentioned it, um, the national debates on, on the rule of law and human rights in the European Union, I mean, I'm encouraging our Dáil and our Shannon to, to do that. That is certainly something that's that's uh, envisaged. I would say though, at the every time we have a dog debate and a question and answer session, which I do after the European Council, there are quite a lot of deputies uh, raise rule of law, human rights issues in, in the European Union, uh, and I think that that's that's an important forum as well. If we start if we start joining our voices and again increasing the profile here, I think gradually uh, has has to have an impact. So again, I'll be I'll be uh, trying to make sure we. Have, we have a lot of stuff in the Dollar General at the moment, but the new year, I certainly want to see um, good debates uh, on, 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 on the rule of law and on human rights uh, in the European Union uh, in, in, in our own national parliament. Well, we're starting to have some questions from our uh, participants. Um, one close to my own heart, uh, I spent a number of years in Strasbourg at the Council of Europe. It's addressed to, to Michael O'Flaherty. In addition to the work, Michael, of the FRA and the European Union, the Council of Europe has contributed significantly to bolstering legal protection for LGBTI plus people over the past two decades, while facing many of the same challenges. To what extent is there cooperation between the FRA and the Council of Europe on LGBTI rights? Yeah, we have an extremely close cooperation. The, um... Uh, we, we, we can never allow ourselves to slip into some form of a competing relationship that would be deeply unhelpful. Uh, the, um, the fundamental rights agency mandate, of course, is designed to complement the Council of Europe one, not to replace it. Uh, we don't have, for example, any adjudicatory function. We're not the guardians of treaties in the way that the Council of Europe is. Uh, we're in daily contact on every imaginable issue. Uh, the, um, whether it be myself and Dunja Miatovic, the Council of Europe Commissioner, liaising closely in terms of how we engage on different issues and countries uh, through a sharing of uh, research findings and pooling indeed of research efforts. That's the case, for example, this week on artificial intelligence, where we're both very much focused on it, but quite deliberately coming from different directions so that we can be of support to each other. Um, the, um, also, I would say the, the, the normative guidance given to us by the European Convention is absolutely central. That, by the way, is why yet another of the priorities we're focusing on right now, maybe just as challenging, is uh, EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but uh, the, no, the, the partnership is very good. It's very healthy. Um, uh, Hell of a lot better than it was when we were first established. Uh, you might remember it yourself, Peter, at that time there was considerable concern that the EU looked like it might be creating a competitor uh, to the Council of Europe, which of course was never the case, but mm -hmm. that's long behind us at this stage. Yeah, but uh, absolutely, Michael, and, and, and as the Minister has mentioned, the, uh, the Norris case was absolutely fundamental uh, yes. to the change in, in Ireland, um, and other cases brought before the uh, the Court of Human Rights were, were fundamental in, in other parts of the uh, of the membership of the uh, the Council of Europe, which of course is 47 rather than 27, and thus uh, has a much broader geographical coverage. Uh, I think another question here on on action outside the EU. The Minister has largely covered it, but uh, I'll just I'll repeat it anyway. What role should Ireland play as an EU member state at global level to further LGBTIQ equality? How does Minister Byrne anticipate the political dynamics of this issue playing out among EU member states? Is it largely subsumed under wider debates on rule of law, or is it emerging as a significant fault line in its own right, for example? Yeah, I, I think the last point's a fair enough point, actually, um, and it's something I'd like to see change. It is, I mean, the rule of law issues, obviously, that we're dealing with at the Council, generally, on the judiciary, on media, um, those types of things. And this is not something I have to say that has really been a major feature of discussion um, you know, at any forum really that I've been at. You know, I'm six months of the job and I'm not at every forum, but it's certainly something I'd like to, I, I've been really conscious of that and it's something I'd like to see how do we get it 
uh, further up the agenda because I know there's no doubt that the um, the solidarity is there with LGBTI people in, in, in Poland and other countries as well. Uh, but how do we just collectively work hard? But just in terms of what the Irish government is doing, I have to say, I think, I think our, our diplomatic staff are just doing tremendous work uh, in, 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 in Poland and Hungary in terms of engaging with the community, in terms of supporting the community, in terms of going to uh, gay pride events uh, with the community and flying the flag, literally. Uh, in the countries of the base, and so I, I think, really, my hats off to them. I think they're doing incredible work, and I certainly uh, hope to join them uh, at some point uh, when when the circumstances allow. But I certainly think it's something that Ireland. I mean, Ireland has obviously led the way on this in in some respects. In other respects, we haven't. Um, but in some respects, we have. I think we never an opportunity to 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 continue to to lead the way and take that particular path. Um, so so that's a moral thing to do. It's a moral obligation on us, I think. Um, but also. Um, you know, part of the reason why people get agitated about this, and it's not the, I say it's a, it's a moral context, very important as well. Part of the reason is we're not contributors to the European Union uh, in terms of the budget, and it should, simply should not be acceptable for us to allow our money to be spent uh, where these activities can take place. So, so that's a financial side to, to what is fundamentally a moral question. I don't want to get away from the morality of it, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a financial side to it as well. I think, I think citizens are going to start questioning that too, and I think, I think they'll be right as well. Really. I have a question here from uh, Peter McLoon, um, are you a member of the Institute. Are your contributors aware of the recent initiative in 20 schools nationwide this is in Ireland to create a school environment that is fully inclusive of LGBTI plus students? Is this type of project the best way forward, ensuring investment in youth and belong to youth services across, uh, belong to youth services across Europe is the best way forward? I imagine the, the education area is covered in the strategy. I don't recall immediately, but uh, Michael, do you have anything to add on that, uh, that, that no, suggestion? Sure. Well, first, education is covered, but um, in terms of encouraging diversity and mutual respect. But of course, it's modest because it again engages the issue of EU competency, where mm, yeah. uh, education in large part stays with the state. Uh, but um, more generally, you know, building up tolerant school communities is 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 really obviously an important thing to do um and it's not an especially difficult thing to do because repeatedly we find uh, that levels of tolerance grow the younger you you go in terms of uh, of checking the the, the levels and, and acceptance so yes i don't know anything about the irish initiative but it sounds very interesting and it, yeah. it corresponds with what we would recognize as as an important part of building those diverse communities indeed I love that point from Michael that it's not an especially difficult thing to do. I think we're actually, none of this is actually especially difficult to do. And from a moral point of view, you just have to make the choice that this is the path you want to take. And I think in schools in Ireland, I, I wasn't aware of that specific project, but um, in my opinion, I was a former education spokesman for the party. I mean, it's about school leadership as well. I mean, and there are certain right. schools that provide fantastic leadership. It doesn't always break down as, as simply as you think in terms of denominational and non-denominational schools. Um, some, are, some are just good and some are, some are not great. And the more we can get into, into the good and great uh, category, the better it is for, for kids and for their lived experiences as well, because that's, uh, that's what's most important. A question here, which manages to bring together uh, the other crisis, COVID <laughs> and LGBT, is from Elaine Cassidy, who's chair of the Department of Transport LGBTI uh, staff uh, network. The pandemic has affected all parts of society, but LGBTI plus people have been particularly impacted in that they can be isolated from their chosen families and have even been advised not to come out. This is acknowledged in the EU LGBTI equality strategy 2020-25, but given that the strategy perhaps does not compel member states to act in some respects, is there scope for further legal provisions that would have more, tr uh, more teeth, so to speak? Well, the, the intersection there, I think intersectionality is, is, yes. is something that the uh, the strategy has particularly majored on Michael. Yeah, I, I think we have as much teeth as we could possibly put there at the moment in terms of the ability of the EU to move legislatively. There's, as I said before, there's large parts of lived experience that are just outside the scope of, 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 of the institutions. I just want to agree with the person who put the question. We've been uh, mapping the impact of COVID for all manner of groups across society and uh, the LGBTI communities are among those who are heavily impacted. Um, it's not just about fear of going out on the street, it's also being, being locked up 
with an intolerant family or in a, in a setting where you can't be yourself. It's about not having the escape of school uh, for, for some youngsters who found that the only place where they could be themselves. Uh, and it's also about um, uh, hate speech online where uh, LGBTI people are being blamed somehow for the virus. I mean, it's palpable nonsense, but they are one of those groups. Uh, other groups include Muslims and Jews and Roma. Uh, who are being targeted as somehow being the vectors of the of the virus? So there, there's 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 all manner of issues there, and um, and we're, we're we're not out of the woods yet. You know, this is this is not stuff from six months ago. This is on a day to day, everyday basis as we navigate through the um, the lockdowns. Indeed, an area in which uh, social media no doubt have a, a role to play. I'm thinking, but the Commission, I think this week is launching a further uh, further initiative in the regulation of social media area, uh, Minister. Yeah, if you don't mind on that specific question, which is very a really important question, but requires very specific answers uh, in terms of what we're... I, I might come back to the Institute if that's okay in written form and you could distribute it to uh, participants or members if that's okay, because I think it just deserves a precise answer because it's asking us what, what we're going to do. Yep. And as a minister, I'm not going to speculate as to what we're doing. I'm going to tell you what we are going to do. So um, I, I'd rather, if that's okay, do that. I'm delighted. It's a really important question and I haven't... I haven't prepared for this uh, particular um, debate sure. on the basis of what we're doing nationally. And, and, it's a, and again, it's such an important question. So if you don't mind, I'll do that. I'll come back. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, Peter, Peter, may I add, forgive me if yes. I jump in. I forgot to mention again, to use that awful word, intersectionality. Um, very, poverty is, is, is very strongly present, present in the LGBTIQ communities. One in three say they have difficulty making ends meet. Uh, for intersex and trans, one in two say that they're poor. Uh, and of course, uh, the pandemic is hitting the poor much harder than those who have resources. It's about precarious jobs, uh, part-time jobs, uh, unplanned for unemployment. And so they, again, this, this, this intersection of the two issues uh, is, is an important dimension of uh, assessing the experience. Uh, two final questions from researchers at the IIEA. In, in a way you've, you've covered You've covered them to some degree already, but I'll, 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 I'll just put them out anyway. From Neil Fallon, a researcher at the, uh, at the Institute, from Michael, in light of the European Commission's proposals today for the Digital Services Act in combating online discrimination and anti-LGBTI uh, plus hate speech, what might some of the key indicators of its effectiveness in this area be and what are its limitations and then a question for, largely for the minister from Alex Conway, also a researcher. How does the minister square massive investment from German car manufacturers, like 100 million from Daimler in Hungary, seemingly being undeterred by legislation passed today banning adoption by same-sex couples? So first, the, the Digital Services Act, uh, Michael. I don't know if it's a bit early to comment on it, but uh, it's only yeah. been launched today. Exactly. It's a bit early for me, too. I mean, I, I haven't had a chance yeah. to look at it carefully. We don't, we don't get sight of these draft pieces of legislation, so I'm as new to it as anybody else. Yeah. Um, the, what, 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 what I could say is that um, key measures of success will be... Um, uh, a great care by platforms in terms of uh, uh, what they publish. Uh, it'll be about uh, voluntary take turn of expression that crosses criminal lines. Uh, it'll be about an ascending uh, pyramid of regulation depending on the levels of risk involved. Uh, so in, in other words, moving from the voluntary actions to the required, legally required actions. And there'll be a, a pathway there depending on levels of risk and exposure. There'll be, um, there'll be a taming of artificial intelligence and its application through requirements of transparency and impact assessment. Uh, so they, they just sum up, but I can't really go for, for, further than that today, I'm sorry. No, but you're reflecting the reality that so much of our lives uh, socially are indeed lived through those, uh, through those channels these days. Minister, the final word is with you on, on those and on any other topics that you'd like to have the, the last word on. Well, uh, the, the question on Daimler actually kind of undercuts the point I was making about uh, <laughs> investment. But I think, I, I think, look, presumably they were planning this for quite some time. It's just some presume. I know that I saw conspiracy theories that it was connected to the, the MFF agreement. I, I certainly have no evidence of that and I haven't read enough to, to know that. Um, and I, I suppose one could say that Daimler weren't, were they aware that there was legislation going to be passed today, uh, which is anti-LGBT, and which it clearly is, and anti-human rights. 
Um, but again, and I, I said this to, to some kids this morning in the school talking about fast fashion. I mean, the consumers have to make their voice heard as well. So, so mm -hmm. we have to uh, do our job as government, but uh, European Commission does its job and, and the institutions, but and our human rights watchdogs as well. Uh, but consumers have to make their voice heard too. So, so when I say about business making its voice, business then is pressured by consumers. So, I, you know, if you have a problem with Daimler doing that, maybe yeah. not, not many people on the call would be buying a Daimler possibly, but uh, <laughs> you know, and make your own choices in the consumer world. Yeah. But, but look, it's a serious point. Um, yeah. And I think, I think it's something that we've got, all got to start thinking of as consumers, uh, how, we deal with, um, how we deal with these issues. Well, we've come to the end of our, uh, our, our long period. I, I just want to express my real appreciation to our two um, panelists and speakers for the, uh, the, the richness and the, uh, the, the informed nature of everything that they have contributed to, to this debate. A first also for the IIEA, I should say, a, a debate dedicated to uh, LGBTI. I do hope that it can be uh, followed up with a, a, a live and in-person event uh, sometime during um, 2021. But uh, with that word of thanks uh, and uh, Season's greetings to all who have who have participated and have listened in. Uh, I leave you for for now, and uh, I leave, uh, as I say, our thanks to um, our two speakers. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.